Okay, there we go. Uh, welcome everybody. Once again, this is Anne Herod Lang, Executive Director of Professionals in Humanitarian Assistance and Protection. Welcome everyone today from Geneva with the whole PHAP team here and several guests also joining us in our office uh, today participating in this online event. Of course, the majority of participants are spread all over the world. I can see from the list here we have uh, almost 40 people now in the event with us and I know joining from, um, from all over the Eastern and Southern Africa regions but also um, all over the world as well. So a very warm welcome uh, to all of you joining us today. Um, we're looking forward to uh, some very interesting presentations and also hopefully an active discussion uh, as we do have a good amount of time. This will be an hour and a half long event so uh, we're looking at about um, 40 minutes uh, of presentation and then we'll have a good amount of time afterwards for discussion. Um, so as I believe most of you are already familiar, I'll just uh, give a very brief introduction to, um, to the purpose of the event, uh, the overall topic, uh, and then uh, of course introduce our speakers and give a, a brief overview of how uh, we use this online prep platform uh, as a means of, uh, of engagement, of bringing in uh, the perspectives of all of you uh, who are actively working um, in the context of humanitarian response in, in different locations. Um, so today's event is a part of a larger series of events that we at PHAP are organizing in partnership uh, with the World Humanitarian Summit Secretariat and in many cases also with other partners. Um, I believe everyone is familiar uh, already with the process of the summit, uh, so I won't go into a lot of detail, but just to say that this particular event um, is an exciting one for us because as those of you who have joined us for recent online events know, uh, there's been a lot of interest in getting deeper into the substantive issues uh, that are facing uh, people in the different uh, regions under examination by the summit process. And this uh, today is really a chance to dig uh, more deeply into some of the challenges specifically in the Eastern and Southern Africa regions and today specifically on one of the four main themes of the World Humanitarian Summit process, which is serving the needs of people in conflict. Uh, so today we're going to be looking within that theme specifically at the issue of interaction with political and military actors uh, and hearing from uh, several different perspectives. We're pleased to welcome today four speakers. We have first Ibrahim Mohammed, who is a project manager with the Zamzam Foundation in Somalia and also chairman of the National Civil Forum. Uh, so we'll be beginning the event today with a presentation from Ibrahim presenting the results of the summit consultation event uh, that took place recently with humanitarian actors in East Africa, uh, specifically relating to interaction with non-state armed groups, militaries, and other actors. We'll then be hearing from Ashley Jackson, who's a research associate with the Overseas Development Institute, known as ODI for short, and also a research advisor with the Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit. Um, we'll be having a presentation from Ashley focusing on interaction with non-state armed groups based on uh, some re research that she's been conducting and particularly looking at findings from uh, East Africa in particular and contrasting with research on similar topics in other parts of the world. We'll then uh, have a presentation from Jules Frost, who's Senior Advisor for Civil, Military, and Police Relations for World Vision International. She's based here in Geneva uh, and, in fact, is joining us in the office today. We're very happy to have her here. Jules will be uh, offering a presentation focusing on interaction with military, peacekeeping missions, uh, etc., specifically in the region. And finally, uh, we're very pleased to have with us Maimuna Mohammed. Uh, who is with the Heritage Institute for Policy Studies in Mogadishu. And Maimuna will be offering a presentation focusing on uh, experiences interacting, interacting with organizations uh, in the region for refugees and then followed by 
uh, some of her reflections on general challenges for the region and potential ways forward. And then again, uh, we'll have a good amount of time for discussion. So I hope that all of you uh, will be actively um, participating in the chat and we'll also uh, today be looking into whether we can bring a few more people um, into the audio discussion as well. So for those of you who are set up with a headset, as I know, uh, I know that several of you are from our recent events, um, if you would like to come in on today's discussion, uh, we'd be more than happy uh, to have you. So, uh, so do feel free to put that hand up um, and we'll bring you into the conversation in the audio as well as the chat. Um, so, without further ado, as promised, we'll be going through a quick um, presentation of who we have in the room here today, uh, and then, um, and then uh, just a few small points on the technical uh, setup and how to use the platform. So, as you can see on the screen in front of you here, as I mentioned, we have a very uh, wide participation today, which is very exciting, about 40 people uh, live in this virtual room, and you can see in the blue here, uh, really from uh, from all over the, the eastern and southern part of Africa, uh, other other parts of Africa, and also, of course, uh, we have a good spread from uh, parts of Asia, from Europe, um, and from North America. So, a warm welcome to everyone, and uh, please do continue to introduce yourselves in the chat. It's a great way to to get to know people uh, that you might not uh, otherwise have the opportunity to uh, to encounter in your work. So, do take advantage of that. Now, uh, moving quickly through the technical points, um, I think you're all very familiar. I can see you're using the chat. We do, uh, as many of you know, have two different uh, channels uh, through which we're uh, inviting people to write. So in the chats, um, uh, here you can, of course, have a, a good open conversation uh, with everybody and, and uh, provide your, your reactions and comments on what's uh, being said in the events. Uh, there is also a way to really direct questions to the panel um, and for us to incorporate those uh, into the discussion. So throughout the uh, presentations, throughout the event, we strongly encourage you, if you have something on your mind, a question that you'd like to see the presenters address, um, put it into the question box. Uh, we'll then be uh, queuing those up here and we'll uh, use them to get started with the Q&A at the end. So do keep those questions coming in. We all already gathered a number before the events, but we're very uh, happy to receive as many as possible. So do uh, be active with the question box. Uh, and then again, as many of you have seen, we have um, the possibility to uh, conduct instant polls. And you can see in front of you on the screen, we have a, a poll up now so that we can learn a bit more about who we have uh, with us in the general, in the virtual room today, um, asking where is your current work location. And uh, we see uh, quite a good uh, split with field headquarters and other uh, be interesting to dig a little uh, deeper into what the other is, um, but uh, in any case, um, neither identifying with field or headquarters, I guess, for many of you. Um, and then how long people have been working in the sector. So again, um, a lot of people here today with significant amount of experience, uh, with 16 or more years. Um, throughout the events, we'll be having more um, uh, uh, substantive questions coming up in the polls. Um, so as you hear the conversation going through the audio and as you're looking at the chat, uh, do keep an eye out for these polls uh, that will pop up. We'll be gathering those responses in real time, and then we can incorporate those as well into the discussion uh, with the guest speakers. So keep an eye out for those. Uh, as soon as you click on the answer, it is registered uh, on our end, so there's no need to click enter. Okay. Um, we also are, um, with the help of our uh, team members here in Geneva, we are conducting at the same time a live Twitter feed, so you can find us if you'd like to go simultaneously on both platforms at PHAP Forum with hashtag ReshapeAid uh, for the summit. And then we've also introduced an alternate way to uh, access the event through live streaming on YouTube. You can see the link here. If you're having trouble with your audio connection, uh, you can, as an alternative to uh, this online event platform, you can see uh, the event taking place through YouTube. Uh, we recommend this. If you're having trouble with the audio, uh, definitely try the YouTube option. Um, however, it's not uh, as interactive, so uh, you'll be able to hear the event 
event, you'll be able to see what's happening on the screen, but if you're going with the YouTube option, uh, you unfortunately won't be able to actually participate in the chat. So if you're able to stay here in the interactive platform, all the better. Okay, very good. So we're going to be moving on now to the uh, the substantive part of, of the event today. And uh, as I uh, mentioned already, we have four speakers joining us today. Very happy to have them with us, Ibrahim, Ashley, Jules, and Maimuna. Um, and you see, uh, again, their, uh, their information, their affiliations on the screen here. And we're hoping that the connection will work out well with Ibrahim. Uh, I know we had a bit of a challenge connecting in Mogadishu, but we are going to um, go to Ibrahim now. And uh, if, we, uh, if it doesn't work out, we'll, we'll come back to you uh, in a few minutes. But I think, I think it's all fine. So Ibrahim, uh, if you will, I'll ask you to start us off with a presentation uh, from some of the uh, regional events related to the summit process. Over to you, Ibrahim. Thank you, Ms. Lee, and thank you very much. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, we hear you very well. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Hamid. I want to thank the PATH family and all humanitarian colleagues on the phone and on, online uh, for participating in this important event. Uh, we, the Zemzem Foundation, uh, did the Somali National Consultation uh, on 18 of August 2014, in partnership with the Humanitarian Forum, UN OCHA, and OIC, the, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, as well as Islamic Relief. We have had about 80 people come who came from 52 different, different organizations, international, local, humanitarian development groups, humanitarian groups, national government, and regional organizations. We come together and, of course, discuss all four thematic topics for, for the WHS. Uh, humanitarian effectiveness, reducing vulnerability, uh, transformation to innovation, and lastly, but not leastly, serving the need of people in conflict. As you all know, Somalia has become incompatible for a conflict. We have had a terrible time for the last 22 years, and therefore, I'm going to focus my, 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 my address to the last one, serving the need of people in conflict. In the few 80 people that came together, we had four different groups that discussed these four different issues. Uh, we came up with the fact that if we address the underlying cause of conflict better, we will have more humanitarian assistance and better delivery system. If I may expand a little bit, uh, we said that humanitarian actors should undertake an in-depth mapping of the IDP and commit a behavioral research on intra-clan community uh, relationships, such as the use of gatekeepers. There needs to be more support for Somali state on building transparent law enforcement institutions. Particularly, one might say, why would you need uh, transparent law enforcement information, uh, transformation transparent in order to deliver aid better. In Somalia, at the moment, there are areas that are controlled by al-Shabaab and areas that are controlled by the government. When you go to al-Shabaab area and you are Somali delivering services, they will need a payment. Unfortunately, the undisciplined Somali soldiers, when you go through them, they too will require some payment. So, we cannot change the behavior of al-Shabaab but indeed, we can change the behavior of soldiers. So we recommend that we should have uh, the international community helping us build uh, more transparent law enforcement institutions. Also, we said humanitarian actors should promote recon reconciliation among communities at all levels. Better coordination between security institutions, humanitarian actors, and community representatives could ensure a more efficient delivery of aid in the community. Uh, we also talk about responding to the diverse nature of the conflict. Despite the diversity of the conflict across the region, there should be an equal amount of investment in responding to humanitarian crisis. Oftentimes, aid delivery risk. And that should equ equation should be looked at an international community will have to be mindful
Secondly, we like how the local communities need to be empowered to deal with the complexity of the conflict. And humanitarian actors must conceptually aware their responses. In a conflict environment, many areas of humanitarian responses get blurred, but it's vital that humanitarian responses be principles of their assistance. We also talk about better transformation from aid to development. We don't want to deliver food all the time when we have highly fertile land and we can help people grow their own food. Uh, we said that a cohesive Somali humanitarian body needs to be created in order to ensure complementary of effort when, trans when, transmitting an information, when transmitting an aid from early recovery to a long-term development. Information data bank should be created, which should act as key resource locally, regionally, and nationally, where everybody will put their research, their research, their research and those who want to come in to the aid community will have easy access and understanding what's going on and what they're going into. We recommended that we should have a better coordination need between local and national regional humanitarian actors. There needs to be better coordination between the stakeholders to avoid publication, duplication of services. Now, uh, Mark has given me some guideline of what I should talk about. For example, uh, what interaction with the state is appropriate and necessary? What's the impact of counterterrorism policies? Let me say a few things first about uh, the impact of counterterrorism policies. We have donors who will tell you where you can spend your money and what, rather than uh, doing in-depth analysis of what the needs are. Uh, as long as you look your aid through the prism of counterterrorism, you will not be effective. And if you partner with local organization, that organization will not be effective either because you are really tying their hand behind their back. Oftentimes, we understand that uh, U.S. aid money cannot be served in a swat held area. When in fact, a swat held area uh, the most needed. And also, we have organizations that acquire much larger security apparatus than they really need. And most of the money will go through paying the security apparatus. We recommend the international community to have a trusted local organization deliver the aid with that security apparatus, without spending most of the money uh, to your security uh, system. Uh, oftentimes, we have a, a aid organizations in Nairobi who have a remote control. That's how they want to deliver services. It's ineffective and costly to do so. If you, however, partner with an organization, I do understand the fear that there might be a corruption or your money might not go to aid, and that's a valid fear. However, the answer is not to pull back or to say that I'm going to deliver from Nairobi. The answer, I think, is to develop a robust monitor and evaluation. Those people will be accountable not only to you and those who will monitor, but also they will be accountable recipients. If you really develop a good monitor and evaluation, from the, down, from the graduates and from the top down, aid delivery will be really much more effective than it is today. Uh, another question to guide me in my discussion is, what interaction with armed group is appropriate and necessary? And what's the beauty of due vigilance, vigilance of humanitarian organizations to avoid that their actors, their actions inadvertently lend support to one of the parties. First of all, it will be, it will be inappropriate to say that if you assist people in the area that are controlled by groups that you don't like, uh, that doesn't mean 
that you are avoiding uh, the group. You are avoiding the community as well. So there has to be a mechanism where you can help the group that are under control by either al-Shabaab or any other groups that are really hostile to the community. One of the things we do in the foundation is we talk to the local communities before we deliver aid. We say to them, you have armed groups in your area that we do not have a direct relationship. In order for us to deliver food, water, or any other services, the elder in that community will have to speak to the armed group in their midst and say that we have, we have this need and we have this group who are willing to come and deliver aid. Will you assure their safety? If they say yes, and the local community also assure us, we will deliver food and services. We do that all the time. We also deliver food and services with the government control. However, for the international community, I understand they're here, but they might not be able to deliver services directly, but they can always use a local group. And I really would like one of the innovations uh, of aid delivery should be a uh, great partnership between the international community and local organizations and also inform the government what exactly you're doing. Oftentimes what happens is one international group will come, they have $10 million worth of uh, proposals. Nobody knows about it. If you do not publicize how much your aid, how large your aid is, people you give to deliver will deliver 10% and we will never know. And they will give you, they will give you a worksheet that gives you 10, 10, 10 million dollars of delivered. However, let me come back to my, my theme. If you have a robust monitor and evaluation from the grassroots as well as top down, you will know exactly how much was delivered. We would like the international community to take a look how aid is delivered in Somalia how it is delivered in complex area, and we will like you to consider not only delivering food and, and, and services, but also try to affect the conflict. Try to create an environment where you can work by having the different war, warring factions come together, by helping the dialogue, by helping transform conflict into a harmonious situation. I hope there will be more questions so I can uh, uh, participate in the discussion, but I will keep my, 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 my presentation short. I, 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 I appreciate the invitation on behalf of Somali community and the Foundation. Thank you for inviting us, and I will hear your questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. Uh, an excellent way to get our conversation started today. And uh, I was uh, I was taking note as you were speaking, and so many um, so many points that you were able to present uh, so articulately and and with um, with concrete examples, which is really uh, one of the best ways to um, to get a, a conversation started. So thank you very much for that. And I'm sure that um, there will be uh, plenty of questions and and comments that we would love to have you weigh in on uh, later in the event so we'll be calling you back on the on the line uh, towards uh, later in the event to, to bring you back into the conversation but thank you very much for starting us off uh, that way um, so we're going to move right along now to Ashley Jackson um, who I believe today is joining us from New York if I'm not mistaken, uh, and as I mentioned, um, Ashley is uh, she's affiliated with the OI Overseas Development Institute, uh, as well as a, as a research advisor with the Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit. Um, and Ashley, we'd like to uh, to invite you to come in um, and present things from your research, uh, picking up on that topic of interaction with non-state armed groups, uh, which I know you've been looking into specifically in the East Africa region, um, and uh, hopefully being able to contrast uh, to some extent with experiences uh, and your findings from other parts of the world. Um, so Ashley, I think we're all connected, and I can uh, hand the floor right over to you. Great. Thank you. Um, so I have a, a brief presentation, but I think Honestly, Ibrahim has taken many of the words out of my mouth and given me a, a great setup on this on this uh, topic. Um, 
So just to start with, you know, why um, we engage with, with armed groups, which I, you know, I think everyone in this chat right now will be completely familiar with, which Ibrahim touched on with really great concrete examples from the region, region. but it really is about maintaining, you know, access and a presence as well as being able to advocate for greater protection and dissemination of and compliance with IHL. And in order to do that, it really means that we have to be perceived as neutral and impartial. We have to talk to all sides. We have to talk to the state. We have to talk to armed groups. We have to talk to whoever's present um, and maintain that impartiality. Now, um, what I'm going to talk about specifically with reference to the region is is work that, that I've been working on for two or three years now regarding armed groups. And it's research done with the ODI as well as others on humanitarian negotiations. And what the project basically was, was that we looked at a couple of countries, Afghanistan, Somalia, um, and Sudan, both Darfur and South Kordofan. And we looked at uh, not only what aid workers and civilians were saying about humanitarian negotiations with armed groups, but we talked to the armed groups themselves. So for example, in Somalia, we worked with the Heritage Institute, actually, to talk to members of Al-Shabaab um, to really understand their policies and perspectives. We did similar things uh, with, with researchers, again, in Darfur and South Kordofan, as well as Afghanistan, um, as well as taking a broader historical look and looking more holistically at places like Syria, Democratic Congo, Yemen, elsewhere. Um, and all of that's available on the ODI website. Uh, but so I won't spend too much time setting up that research, but talking more about the issues that, that Ibrahim began to raise and that are at the, the center of this chat. Now, the core finding of, of all of this research, regardless of the country we looked at, was that basically, you know, there are formidable challenges to effective engagement with armed groups. And, and few of them are new. Many of them have existed since the dawn of humanitarian action. Um, but what we were finding is that humanitarian agencies are often poorly prepared and equipped to engage effectively. There's much more, essentially, that we can be doing, should be doing, should be working towards that will enable us safe access and better relations with armed groups. Um, so I'm first going to talk a little bit about the challenges, and then I'm going to move on to some of the, the you know, findings about what aid agencies might be, might be able to work towards in the future, should be working towards. <coughs> so the key challenges of engaging with armed groups were not dissimilar uh, from those that arise from engaging the states often. You know, what you'd find was a lack of, of command and control. Um, this is certainly true across various contexts at different times. For example, in Darfur, in the conflict there, what we found was that at one point, early on in the conflict around 2004, you had relatively unified armed groups who were open to humanitarian access. It wasn't easy, it wasn't simple, but you could negotiate with them. Later on, after the signing of the, the DPA, these groups fractured. Um, and I'm sure you know others in the audience have just looked down the list knew much more about, about that situation because they were actually there at the time. But it, it illustrates the fluidity of, you know, if you negotiate with one member of an armed group or a leader, is it really going to hold? Um, so you have to engage comprehensively and, and with all of them. Uh, military imperatives, you know, it simply may not be in the interest of an armed group to negotiate with humanitarian actors. They, they may not have any <laughs> interest in, you know, at letting an aid agency in, um, or it may threaten them. Often how this manifests, particularly in the examples of, of Somalia um, and, and DRC, is, is in terms of, well, these aid agencies, they must be spies. Uh, and their, their presence, their bearing witness, threatens us in some way. Um, which takes me to the last two factors. You know, a lack of understanding of IHL or humanitarian objectives, as well as suspicion and a view of aid agencies as the enemy, as somehow an outside other entity, Western-driven, against the values and cultures and, and what the armed group wants to achieve. Now, just tackling the first one, the lack of understanding of IHL and humanitarian objectives, 
this is of course not unique to, to armed groups. This is something as humanitarians, one must consistently repeat you know, who you are, what you believe in, what your objectives are, again and again and again, um, whether it be with states, with local populations, or with members of armed groups. Um, suspicion and, and view of aid agencies as, as the enemy. Um, you know, there is what we found in Somalia, and I'll, I'll go into this a little bit uh, further, but it's it certainly not surprising that it was seen. Western agencies were seen as, as you know, uh, Christian, even if they were not, um, as being you know, the instruments of Western powers who were aligned against al-Shabaab. You know, this is, of course, true of, of groups in Syria and Afghanistan and Pakistan and elsewhere. Um, and the shocking thing about this is, as any of us will know, on the ground, especially in volatile contexts, whoever the agency is, the vast majority of the staff are going to be of the local population. They're going to be Somali, they're going to be uh, you know, in the community, living there. Um, and so they're not this Western other. <laughs> you know, they, are, they are members of the community. And so in a way, it doesn't matter often the face you put forward in that respect. But what we found in the Shabbat exam course was that they use this as an excuse to expel aid agencies. Um, you saw this with the UN Mine Action Service with uh, multiple other aid agencies, including the ICRC. Um, but it was this view of aid agencies as being a threat uh, that often undermined their ability to be present. Before moving on, it, it's important to, to point out that there may be a flip side here. You know, the lack of understanding of IHL may, over time, transfer into it and through engagement and understanding of IHL and a desire to sort of be seen to be adhering to IHL so that it gives the armed group legitimacy. Um, and, and why I bring that up is there's a really, really important example from this region and that's the government of South Sudan. When they were uh, the SPLM, they, you know, they had extensive engagement with Geneva Call, which worked with them on, you know, removing landmines and signing a deed of commitment, an agreement to, to which was somewhat similar to the landmine ban treaty when they were an armed group. And the you know they were very responsive to this because this gave them in peace talks and in engagement with the international community as they aspired to the state and aspired to independence, it gave them a little bit of leverage. You know, look, we respect international humanitarian law, uh, we don't want landmines all these kinds of things. So there, you know, the resistance can transfer to desire. And in the case of South Sudan, the landline ban treaty um, was you know, the first piece of international law, first international convention that that government ascended to, which is really, it really shows that engagement early on with these groups can transfer long term into concrete gains for humanitarian action um, and protection. Secondly, suspicion, the flip side of that, is co-option. Um, and these can coexist. We see, of course, in the Al-Shabaab case, there may be a suspicion of aid agencies that is, you know, Western-driven and against the values that Al-Shabaab ultimately uh, holds so high. But they're not above, you know, uh, coercing and extorting from aid agencies, trying to extract food aid, trying to take credit for the work of aid agencies in the few that they allow to operate in areas under their control. Um, and so aid agencies must walk a really, really tight line between negotiating and trying to get access and avoid being co-opted, being, avoid being um, you know, seen to benefit uh, the armed group. And, and that's a near impossible task and one that you know, aid agencies constantly struggle to remain on the right side of. Now, there are also challenges imposed by states and donors um, that, you know, again, Ibrahim has touched upon and, and will not at all be surprising. There's this inability to distinguish and a blurring of the lines. Um, and the classic example is in Iraq and Afghanistan, you had the provincial reconstruction teams, you had for-profit contractors doing hearts and minds activities, um, and it was all of a sudden as though there are all these people driving around in white vehicles with different motivations, doing aid work, and no one could tell the difference. And, and aid workers, genuinely humanitarian workers, were getting caught up in the violence. 
Now that's not limited to Iraq and Afghanistan, of course, you have uh, for-profit contractors in Somalia and elsewhere, Yemen, of course, um, other locations doing a similar kind of thing. I mean, this is the landscape of where we work in stabilization contexts, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and there's a lot that donors and whose governments do to contribute to this, this confusion, um, and very little that humanitarian agencies themselves can control with respect to this. A related um, issue which comes up a lot in the debate on UN integration and other things is a lack of a distinct voice, a humanitarian voice at the, the highest levels. This came across really clearly in the Sudan context and in both case studies. You know, the fact that the host state was so opposed to engagement, particularly in South Kordofan, with armed groups that it really paralyzed uh, humanitarian diplomacy at the high level and created a lack of, of leadership and fragmentation um, and really undermined the ability of aid agencies to sort of stand up for this need to engage with all sides. The last two factors, very briefly, um, are really about you know, counter-terror, about the legal restrictions, about trying to limit contact. And this can manifest from donors, of course, with counter-terror legislation, um, as well as host states. And again, uh, Sudan was a really big example from, from the cases we looked at. I won't go too much into this, because if I do, there will be a temptation for me to talk for hours about counter-terror legislation. And um, I'm, I'm sure it, it's something that will be best explored in the discussion. But just to say briefly, in Somalia, this had devastating consequences during the famine. It really paralyzed agencies. Um, and, and it, you know, from the time it was recognized to be a problem to the time where action was taken to remedy it, it was a huge lag. And you know, people died, I would say, as a result. It's hard to sort of pin causality, but you did have just this incredible paralysis. And it's an issue that lingers. Somalia is, of course, going to face famines, unfortunately, in the future, is going to face crises like this. Yet this regime of legislation, this fear, this paralysis um, that aid agencies experience uh, as a result for fear of being put in jail or having the funding cut, it remains unresolved. So we're still in a position in Somalia that's not very different from where we started. Um, we may have a better understanding of the consequences of this legislation, but it remains in place. In terms of in, in challenges, and I'm going to try and be as brief as possible, our main finding was that there was a spectrum of how aid agencies try to approach negotiations with armed groups. At one end, at the, at the left side, the structured engagement, that was where it was really at. That's where you had the best return on your investment and your engagement. You know, this, this ideally comprised direct negotiation with the armed group, where it was productive and feasible. In the case of al Shabaab, of course, you know, that was much more difficult than any other armed group we looked at. But in DRC and elsewhere, um, you know, this, this was possible, certainly in Sudan. Um, you had formal agreement, you know, written agreement or whatever else, verbal agreements with the armed group that really clearly stipulated uh, how the engagement was to take place. You had dialogue at all levels. So you had your field staff and your headquarters staff and your staff in Nairobi or wherever else really on the same page <clears throat> and all engaging with different levels of the armed group. And perhaps most importantly, you had strong, strong internal systems, staff training, policies, internal communication and transparency uh, to the degree, again, it was productive and feasible that, that supported this process. Now, very, very few agencies we found pursued an approach exactly like I just described. Uh, particularly in the Somalia context, as well as in South Kordofan, there was a lack of this structured engagement. Part of that arose from counter-terror legislation. Often in um, the Somalia case, you had field staff so dislocated, both geographically um, and to some extent you know, psychologically, from, from the, the crisis. They were sitting in Nairobi. Um, and didn't have, you know, weren't able to get on the ground in Somalia, and it created this, this disconnect from staff on the ground in Somalia who, or partners who 
were doing the best they could to negotiate under almost impossible circumstances, given what Al-Shabaab often demanded of them. And then you had headquarters staff in Nairobi who didn't really, frankly, know quite the, the pressures and, and these kinds of things that their field staff were facing on the ground. In turn, field staff were afraid to really tell the truth a lot of the time about what was going on for fear that their operations would be shut down and so forth. So it was really difficult, don't ask, don't tell, you know, dynamic, entrenched in, in fear, um, and, and, and really impossible to negotiate. But some agencies were able to do it much better than others, to be able to communicate with their field staff and really try to support them, um, to try to have these policies in place. Now, briefly, what we going into some of the, the details on, on what we found is that you know, making the case for structured engagement, it's an, it's an obvious one, but when you look at the real challenges that people face in, in the small context and in, in other contexts where there's incredible pressure on aid agencies not to talk to uh, armed groups, you sort of have this um, downward transfer of risk and responsibility. And in Somalia, as well as in numerous other countries, Afghanistan among them, Syria among them, what we found was that you know, managers in local capitals or headquarters locations didn't feel that they had the ability to ask or didn't simply ask or didn't know or weren't told what exactly was going on. And part of that was the consequence, again, of not having the right structures and training and resources in place to support engagement. And this is just a, a brief um, quote from an aid agency manager in Nairobi. He said, you know, from Nairobi, it was easy to say no, meaning, no, we won't give us about money, no, we won't negotiate. Um, and all of the pressure was on your staff, the suppliers, contractors, who were then having to organize themselves. And this was a dynamic that, again, came out. We would talk to field staff who on the ground in Somalia, and we would talk to their managers in, in Nairobi. And it was exactly this. Um, however, again, as I say, there, was, there were agencies that were able to do it better and more coherently and more cohesively. And finally, the lack of oversight and financial risk. Um, we may talk about counter-terror legislation as being you know, something that, that is an obstacle and so on and so forth. But we, what we found was that when people took this uh, disconnected acceptance approach or, or a less structured approach to negotiations where, you know, field staff were doing what they had to under extreme pressure and headquarters staff didn't really know what was going on, often they were paying off armed um, groups. They were, you know, not, not out of any, um, you know, not just, it was not that they were doing something malicious or driven by greed. Often that was not the case. It was that they were trying to help people who were literally, in the small case, starving to death. Um, but you did have this financial leakage. You did have this stuff that counter terror legislation. Uh, and the, the kind of oversight we put in place to manage our operations is meant to guard against. Um, so, I mean, it, it's worth. It's worth mentioning that you know there is, I mean, there is an issue in terms of that corruption, that lack of oversight. Um, Counter-terror legislation is obviously not the answer, but what it is important to, to to address is that you know by having more coherent, transparent engagement around groups and more open um, to the degree that it's possible engagement, you're going to guard against that oversight and financial risk. So there's actually a case for saying, you know, if we engage with an armed group in a coherent way and we assert our right to do that as humanitarian actors, we're going to be in a better position to guard against the very thing that those who um, are proponents of counter-terror legislation are advocating, uh, if that makes sense. So um, I'll wrap it up there just because I know we need to keep it moving and I think you know, all these issues are much better talked about after afterwards. So thanks very much for your time. This is my email in case you have any questions, and I'll hand it back to the moderator. Great, thank you, Ashley. And uh, yes, I think uh, your presentation, the research that uh, you've been able to share with us really builds 
perfectly on the first um, presentation from Ibrahim, so thank you so much um, for continuing um, the discussion there. As you were speaking, we had a number of uh, questions and comments coming in, um, so uh, you really did um, help inspire a lot of a lot of thought here, and I'm uh, looking forward to digging into that in the discussion. Um, before we do that, though, I want to make sure that we uh, give time to to Jules and also Maimuna um, to see where we can take things next, because um, uh, I think we'll continue to uh, unearth uh, a lot of uh, interesting questions and some of the uh, some of the points may already be addressed uh, in these two presentations and particularly the next by Jules um, so uh, without further ado Jules I'd like to um, to invite you to speak and my uh, colleagues on the technical end here are uh, reminding me that um, uh, we are going to be changing the poll so if any of you are currently typing in the poll uh, asking what interaction with armed groups is appropriate and necessary I'm going to give a countdown if you could click enter so that we don't lose your input uh, when we change it that would be very much appreciated we're going to change it in three two one Okay, thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, and now, Jules, we're going to uh, turn the floor over to you. So again, Jules is going to be uh, offering a presentation today focusing on interaction with military uh, and peacekeeping missions in the region. Jules, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank PHAP and the World Humanitarian Summit uh, for this opportunity, and it's a real privilege to follow on after Ibrahim and Ashley. Uh, as uh, has been stated, I'm going to try to focus my comments more on the state armed actors or the UN peacekeeping side of the house. But what I will share, I think, is also uh, relevant uh, to a good extent and can be applied also with engagement uh, for non-state armed actors. So. I am going to respond to four key areas that were raised um, uh, by PHAP and the World Humanitarian Summit. The first one that I want to talk about is what the goals of humanitarians interaction with armed forces or armed groups be. And I would say the overarching goal of any degree of engagement with state or non-state armed actors should be to advance the humanitarian imperative to save lives and reduce human suffering. And to do that through the provision of impartial assistance and protection that's in alignment with international standards, guidelines, and international humanitarian law. And of course, this should be based on need and not driven by political or military motivations. So that's the ultimate goal for our engagement. What we do know, and as um, my colleagues have shared with you, is that managing relationships with armed actors in a manner that protects principles and the safety of humanitarian staff in the communities we serve is and will continue to be a complex task. To do this, one of the key things I'd like to remind us of and emphasize is that the objectives of military forces or other armed actors, including peacekeeping forces, are fundamentally different from humanitarians. We may share the same space, but most often, almost 99% of the time, not the same mission. And I would say this is particularly true in armed conflicts and complex emergencies, which is really uh, the focus of my discussion today, not focusing on our engagement with these state actors in natural disasters which often is a little bit easier in comparison. So thinking about the goal that I stated, our aim in humanitarian military coordination or referred to as civil military coordination is to develop a constructive coordination approach which minimizes the potential for competition and conflict between different actors working in the same space while minimizing due Application and the disruption to each other's activities. Now let's talk about a little bit of what interaction with the state is appropriate and necessary. This becomes increasingly a difficult question to answer 
when the state is a party to the conflict. Um, and it makes a significant difference. So one of the big takeaways, as I'm sure most people online would say, is context matters. And we need to understand context, as was highlighted in the Somalia situation. But knowing that, or given that, we also recognize that national governments have the primary responsibility to provide and coordinate humanitarian assistance within its territory uh, to its people. But often, they're either unwilling or unable to do so. And that's where the humanitarians come in. So again, when you're engaging with the state and what is appropriate and necessary, we have to select the appropriate coordination strategy. And I'd like to show you a slide here, if I can switch. OK. And what I've shown you here, or what is on the screen, is what we call a continuum of engagement. Interaction between the humanitarian and military actors ranges from one of potential close cooperation, or some people would use the term collaboration, to the minimum, which might be coexistence. Now, what this picture that you see, this is uh, basically an illustration of OCHA's continuum of engagement. World Vision, with whom I work, we've added a fourth option to where if the environment is such, our least or most, uh, what do I want to say, not preferred option is where we might have to curtail presence. But that is something we have to consider. It might be just that we need to hibernate, but what type of engagement do we have with these armed actors? Um, we need to do an analysis. Now, whichever of these, what I would call, approaches or strategies, Whichever coordination strategy is selected, essential is, as Ashley has said in Ibrahim, that humanitarian military or humanitarian armed actor dialogue is critical. And this really forms the basis for effective civil military relations. It enables mutual understanding of each other's role, mandate, objectives, and principles. But one of the guarding principles here that we need to keep in mind is this dialogue shouldn't be for dialogue's sake. It should always be driven with the clear objective in mind of protecting and assisting civilians. We have some guidance, uh, international guidance, that I just want to mention. Um, maybe some people, oh, I see uh, some of the answers in the um, broadcast are, are addressing these guidelines, but we have the Oslo and the MCDA guidelines, um, as well as guidelines on the use of armed escorts that have been produced and circulated through the IASC, uh, where the UN agencies and international NGOs come together, along with local NGOs, looking at um, how do we do this. And in contexts like Somalia, country-specific guidelines are often developed and agreed to by the humanitarian country team along with the humanitarian coordinator. And a great recent example of this is the production of the country-specific guidelines in Somalia, which were just uh, finalized in September um, and endorsed by the AU, Amazon, and the humanitarian country team. So for those that are, uh, oops, somehow I'm moving my, wasn't quite ready to move. Did somebody move my presentation? Sorry, let me go back. OK, we're on the continuum still. Um, I would highly uh, recommend a, a review of those guidelines for those folks that are working in Somalia. There are also country-specific guidelines in South Sudan. The Congo, or Democratic Republic of Congo, has revised and have made some additions. So moving from there, another question that's been posed is, what is the duty of due diligence for humanitarian organizations to ensure or to attempt to avoid that their actions inadvertently lead to support to one of the parties of a conflict, whether that be the state or rebel movements or opposition. And some of these aspects have been touched on. The first to emphasize is distinction. We need to ensure as humanitarians that we remain distinct from the military. This is crucial for humanitarian actors and their security. To remain distinct, it is important to 
uh, consider venues where humanitarian and military dialogue can take place. Neutral venues should be sought out as an example. Another component of uh, due diligence is where and when possible, um, an appropriate mechanism for liaisoning with the state armed actors uh, should be established. OCHA uh, has the mandate and is often in the position to take the lead in providing this liaison function between the military and humanitarian actors. Ideally, a formal mechanism which can create an important space between humanitarian organizations and the military is established. Um, and we've had this in various settings. This often is critical to helping organizations maintain neutrality or at least the perception of neutrality by creating distance and having OCHA uh, play uh, that function of information exchange. And depending on the coordination strategy that's selected, um, one wants to use different liaison approaches to facilitate this interface. And this is often dependent on the type of emergency. So now what I'd like to show, and it seemed maybe the slide didn't pick up entirely. Let's see. OK, unfortunately, um, the chart that's supposed to be inside this, we're just going to have to pretend it's there, um, is illustrating a degree of engagement with state armed actors, as well as the type of task we would expect military to participate in, dependent on what's occurring in the environment. So for instance, across the top of this chart, <laughs> which you don't see, would be how do we engage with military uh, during peacetime? Or what could their activities be during peacetime? Versus then peace support operations, which might be peacekeeping and peace enforcing. And then to the far right would be when these various state actors are involved in combat. And as they uh, go to the right, from peacetime to combat, the impartiality of their forces. Um, I see we have a screenshot, so great. Thanks, Marcus, for getting that in there. That'll help a lot. You can see that the degree of engagement uh, diminishes. And how we relate increased distance is often required. So one of the things you can see in this chart is that um, what are the types of assistance the military can provide in humanitarian crises. And in conflict environments, it's quite limited. And we'd like to see it um, as indirect, looking at where they provide unique capabilities. And that being really used as a last resort. And often people are like, what's the last resort? Well, if we refer to some of these guidelines that I've mentioned, a last resort, uh, the criteria are set out quite um, clearly, and we have to do the analysis to determine that. And I'll come back to that in a moment. OK, so we've talked about distinction, appropriate liaison mechanism, and then what type of information do we share? This seems to often be an area of conflict. What do we share? What don't we share? And again, I think. Uh, Humanitarians need to be able to share information, but again, always with the purpose of protecting and providing assistance to those we serve. And humanitarians under no circumstance should share information that gives one party to a conflict a tactical advantage over another or that would endanger civilians. I think uh, a guiding principle, and I saw someone in one of the chat lines put this, we must always keep in mind the principle of do no harm. And I would say in conjunction of how do we do more good and how do we look at our engagement with military actors with that lens in mind. I want to mention one level of guidelines here um, that I invested quite a bit of time on with a host of people within the UN system. And this is the guidelines around the use of armed, es armed escorts. And uh, an important general rule that's established is humanitarian actors will not use escorts or armed protection for humanitarian activities. Um, we would only do that or may choose to do that in exceptional circumstances when it's a last resort. 
when there are no civilian options, when the negotiation for acceptance strategy doesn't work and the humanitarian imperative is the driving force and our program is determined to be of increasing or eminent importance uh, to life-saving activity. In general, um, we should be looking for alternatives to armed protection. We should ensure that when we do need to use them that there's an appropriate process and that we organize and manage that type of armed protection correctly. Um, and we've done a lot of work to provide the guidance on that and I think one thing we as humanitarians need to do is to go back to the guidance apply it and where it doesn't work then we need to get that feedback to revise it to help those that are on the ground overcome the challenges that we're talking about. So the last area just to address briefly is what is the proper interaction with peacekeeping forces but I would say what's the proper interaction with them and others and critical to answering that is the context. So before deciding what level of interaction you might have with a peacekeeping force or another armed actor, it is necessary to weigh the benefits of that engagement with the projected impact on local perceptions as well as the conflict dynamics. Keeping in mind the immediate objective, but also what are the long-term implications, um, which there are many, and often we're focused on today, and rightly so, but we can't ignore the implications of what we do for the future of our ability to continue working with those that were there to serve. One last time I'll emphasize context analysis is critical to the decision-making process. In short, it's a balancing act between our core humanitarian principles which have been highlighted and sometimes necessary pragmatic decisions that we must make at the field level. And sometimes this means that we have to compromise our humanitarian principles. But when we do that, it's important that these are decisions we make strategically and they're well thought out and that we understand the potential negative consequences of compromising on our principles and we put in place a plan to mitigate to the best of our ability those negative impacts. And I want to leave you with one last slide here. Marcus, maybe you can help me. Let's see. There we go. It's an image to try and help you think about the balancing act of between our primary principles of the humanitarian imperative, impartiality, independence. Neutrality isn't there, but also the perception of neutrality, the safety of our staff and the communities, and the sustainability of our activities uh, to continue to serve with the pragmatic decisions of how do we engage. Are we going to coexist? Are we going to coordinate? Or are we going to cooperate? with state armed forces in this particular instance or any armed forces. The CAM piece under here, um, if we had a little more time I'd go into, but it's that when you make these decisions and you may compromise, you need to ensure there's compelling justification, you've done an adequate assessment, and you've put a mitigation plan in place. So with that, I'll close and hand it back to you. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jules, um, uh, for uh, yeah, really enlightening presentation, and I think again uh, inspiring a lot of thought uh, on the part of our participants here. Um, I just want to highlight. Um, I didn't have uh, the chance before, but just looking at the poll here, which many of you have taken the time to answer. So as Jules has been giving her presentation, uh, we asked the virtual room here uh, the question, in conflict situations, should humanitarian actors cooperate more with peacekeeping missions? And I think an interesting response, so about a third of you, 33%, uh, uh, saying that yes, humanitarian organizations should increase cooperation in general with peacekeeping missions, but then the majority, about uh, oh, more than half actually here, uh, saying that actually there's a split. So some humanitarian actors should increase cooperation with peacekeeping and other humanitarian actors should maintain their distance. So really um, highlighting uh, the idea that 
different organizations, different humanitarian organizations with different mandates uh, really should for, uh, for the overall uh, purpose of the humanitarian effort um, take very different approaches. So it is, uh, that is indeed one additional layer of complexity um, to these very complex challenges that we've, uh, uh, that we've been examining today. Uh, so now, moving to our final um, guest speaker, we'd like to try to turn to Maimuna Mohammed, uh, who, as I mentioned at the start, uh, will be hopefully able to give us a presentation today focusing on experience interacting with organizations in the region, uh, specifically for refugees, uh, and also highlighting uh, afterwards a few general challenges for the region and potential ways forward. So a lot of the um, chat uh, discussion that we've seen here and a lot of the answers that we've seen coming in response to the, the open response polls uh, has really been um, uh, indicating a, a hunger for uh, for some clarity on how how steps uh, can be taken forward. Again, it's a complex situation, um, and when looking at questions regarding whether and how to engage uh, with different actors, particularly different armed actors, uh, there are clearly important um, pros and cons to consider. Um, so, Maimuna, uh, I believe we were having some some difficulty with the audio connection, so we're going to try to call her in now. Okay, uh, so it looks like that's not working out uh, just this moment, so we're going to move on uh, to some discussion uh, and hopefully be able to uh, to bring uh, Mohammed, uh, sorry, bring uh, Maimuna back in. Okay, great. So um, before we move on to the next phase here, we're going to again uh, move on to the next poll. So as I did before, I'm going to ask anyone who is currently typing an answer uh, to the current poll question uh, to click enter uh, so that we don't lose your input uh, within the next three seconds. So I'll do a countdown and then we'll switch. We'll change in three, two, one. Okay, very good. See, we've been getting some excellent input. And just a quick note, although we may not have time to get into all of the discussion points, uh, all of the questions today, um, this uh, event today, this consultation is, as I mentioned, part of a much larger process. And we'll be connecting it up with, uh, with the events that we have in the coming weeks, as well as uh, the ongoing uh, discussion on the, the written forum on the summit website. So bringing everything together and ensuring that all of the excellent points being made today and the questions um, are addressed one way or another, uh, as it's very important to bring all this into the discussion uh, leading towards the next stage in the summit process. Um, so we have a few questions I'd like to pose to the speakers, and I also want to invite anybody who is participating in the event today, if you have a headset and are prepared to come in to the audio discussion, you're very welcome to do so. I know we spoke with a few people before the event uh, about this possibility. Uh, if you'd like to come in, just click at the top of your screen. You see a person uh, with his arm raised in the air. If you click that button, then we'll see you raising your hands, and, and we will uh, turn and give you the floor so you can make comments or, or pose a question live on the so Please do take advantage of, of that opportunity to be a part of the, the audio discussion. OK, so we have uh, a couple of questions for Ashley uh, and a couple of questions specifically for um, for Ibrahim. So we're going to uh, go to those first. Uh, so for Ashley, we have a question coming in from Abdul Fattah. Uh, he's asking how political and military actors balance uh, security risks in humanitarian aid delivery in areas where armed groups are present. Uh, and actually, this may be one, uh, Jules, that you might be interested in coming in on as well, uh, following, uh, following Ashley's uh, input. Uh, also for Ashley, we have a question coming in from Mohammed 
um, a related question, uh, again, wondering about the challenge of coordination uh, of military and civil departments, so looking at the different uh, strategies that um, uh, from, the, from the government side uh, coming into a region, uh, how uh, coordination of the strategies between the military piece and the civil piece um, uh, is done uh, and, and could potentially done better. And also a question um, coming from a different angle, um, regarding the point that you made, uh, Ashley, regarding the perceptions of uh, aid groups, uh, wondering what are your thoughts on why it is that aid groups are uh, sometimes seen as agents of the West and uh, from your own perspective uh, following your research, is it because many uh, aid groups have ideological agendas of various kinds, so not uh, necessarily a religious um, angle but other uh, other potentially uh, visible ideological agendas in their work, or in your view, is it um, a result of double mandates, uh, as they're so called, that uh, presuppose support for the government in these contexts? Um, so, Ashley, we'll take those questions to you now, and then uh, following your inputs, we'll pose some questions uh, to Ibrahim uh, and also to Jules. So, uh, over to you, Ashley. Sure, that's um that's a full plate of questions. So I'll do the I'll do the best that I can, or at least just lay the groundwork for Jules and Ibrahim to to really come in and, and talk about some of these issues. Uh, in response to Abdul Fattah about uh, how political and military actors uh, negotiate security and risk, um, a lot of ways in which I could respond to that. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, <clears throat> in terms of you know the specifics of what Abdul Fattah wants to know, but. From my perspective, I mean, I glazed over this in my presentation, but on one of the slides there was a picture of the DRC um, intervention brigade, and it was, you know, uh, a UN soldier with a UN helmet on and saying a UN tank with a semi-automatic weapon perched on the shoulder. So <clears throat> it just, for that, you know, that to me illustrates how differently, uh, the extreme end of how differently political uh, and peacekeeping actors negotiate security from humanitarian actors who, by contrast, don't carry guns, rarely use armed escorts, are very careful about it when they do, uh, and, and primarily rely on engagement, negotiation, acceptance by all sides in order to negotiate their own security and the security of those people they're trying to help. Um, and that obviously comes into conflict. Uh, particularly where you have integrated missions, but even where you don't, um, that the UN, that even uh, other UN mandated forces, for example, ISAF in Afghanistan or other AU led uh, peacekeeping forces around the world, really, it, it creates this tension and often conflicting values and goals and approaches. Um, that are, become very difficult for humanitarians to negotiate. Jules, I'm sure, and Ibrahim can talk much more about this. Um, <clears throat> but just moving on to the related question Mohammed posed in terms of coordination, um, and again, I think Jules will have really interesting things to say about this that I look forward to hearing. Uh, you know, it is very difficult in a number of contexts where you have humanitarian actors operating, there's this tension with the rest of the international community where they really want space. You know, they want to engage impartially and neutrally with all sides, including armed groups. And in order to do that effectively, in order to be perceived as neutral and not part of a stabilization agenda, a peacekeeping agenda, you know, whatever political agenda might be at play, they have to separate themselves from, you know, UN-led coordination mechanisms, uh, other coordination mechanisms try to be really discreet in their dealings with the military, whether that's the host government military, a peacekeeping force, whatever it might be. Um, and I think, again, this is a really fine line and, and a really, and it's almost like a tightrope that they have to tread in terms of doing the minimum or doing the necessary coordination with all sides. Uh, including the political and, and, and military actors, but also trying to stay apart from it, above the fray, trying to preserve their identity, and most importantly, the perception of their identity as neutral and impartial. Um, 
And we talk about it endlessly. We talk about it in context after context. It's not a science. We have tools that will help us in terms of guidelines and best practices. Um, but it's something day in, day out that humanitarian actors are constantly being pulled in different directions and have to negotiate it as best they can. Uh, finally, in terms of perceptions, it, it's, it's a very <laughs> good question. Why are, why are they seen as, as agents of the West? Um, and last month for ODI, I pulled together a comparative policy brief. It's very short. It's four pages um, about Taliban and Al-Shabaab perceptions of aid agencies. Um, and even if you're not interested in Afghanistan or Somalia, a lot of what we found them saying was true of other contexts. So it, it's definitely worth uh, checking out. Um, and I say that <laughs> not to plug my own work, but because it touches on a lot of these issues. Um, so to summarize, I mean, basically what we found was, you know, from foot soldiers of all of the various armed groups we talked about, but particularly the more extremist, um, fundamentalist groups like Shabaab, like uh, the Taliban, there was a really strong perception of aid agencies, even national aid agencies, as somehow being tied to the West, somehow being tied to uh, anti-Islamic values, whatever that means. Um, and not a lot of that was rid in reality. But what was interesting was how humanitarian activities, basic things that we think of as like you know, day-in, day-out routine things like doing assessments or signposting our activities were construed as, as, as being, you know, part of this Western agenda to undermine uh, local values and compromise things. So what, what we really talked about in, in some of this work was that, you know, this is why it's important to engage. This is why it's important to talk to foot soldiers to get intermediaries or interlocutors, whether they be mullahs or respected people within the community and elders to engage on your behalf with armed groups where it's appropriate and where it doesn't put them at risk. And also for aid agencies to engage with mid-level commanders, to engage with the senior leadership. Um, having all these relationships is important because that's how you communicate who you are, that you're not an agent of the West. Um, but you not only communicate it, you demonstrate it over time. And it's really this not only talking about who you are, but day in, day out, being consistent about what we do, showing that the programs that we do are not about what you want to do in Somalia, or what you want to do in whatever country, but it's about what the community wants. So not coming in and saying, we're going to give you gender capacity building, if that's not something the community has clearly articulated as a need. Um, so really being aligned with community needs, if you that you're there to help the community, doing very good programming. So, you know, you come in, you consult with the community, you design a program together, and you do it well. So you don't use shoddy contractors, and you don't, you know, you don't do something that falls apart after two months. Because what happens is then the armed group or, or other members of the community turn around and say, well, that's strange. They came here to help. They said they were experts. They didn't do a very good job. They must have been here to gather intelligence. They must have had some other motivation. And, and you, you, I mean, this might sound a little bit crazy, but you can start to see it from their perspective, because it would make some, no sense that you would spend all this money in this community and do something that ultimately falls apart or doesn't work. Um, so, so it's all these kinds of things that you begin to see why basic good development and humanitarian practice is so instrumental in saving lives and keeping aid workers and communities safe is because if you do things poorly, if you don't do what you say you're going to do, then it really does actually put you at risk. It starts to feed into these suspicions. And, and you know, they can then attack you or expel you and justify it on those grounds. Um, very briefly on the double mandates part, I'm not totally convinced that it's a fine line again and one where aid workers and agencies have to use their best judgment. But you know, working with the government in one area, for example, to, to foster better health services provided by the government um, could, be, uh, could be seen as, you know, part of neutrality and impartiality if you're doing the same thing in rebel or insurgent held areas. If you're doing something that could categorize as stabilization, 
that's about extending the reach of the government or fighting an insurgency, yeah, I mean, that's going to compromise you, of course, because the armed group is going to know about it. Um, but if you're doing something that builds up local systems that are seen as, as critical by all sides, I, I think you're on more solid ground, and that's that's less likely to compromise you. Um, and and in a lot of these co chronic chronic contexts, what the armed groups don't want humanitarian agencies to do is simply hand out food and leave. What we heard again and again from armed groups across all of the contexts we worked in was that. You know, aid agencies need to be doing long-term stuff. If they just come and they leave, you know, what good is that? So, again, I think it's, it's more nuanced than saying, like, you know, if you have a, a multi-mandate agency, they're going to have less access or they're going to be less accepted because that's not what we see on the ground. It, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, but I've talked long enough, so I will hand it back uh, to the other speakers to, to respond. Excellent. So, Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you, Ashley. I know it was quite a plate of questions we were posing there, and I have to say there are many more coming in. So I've just been discussing with our team here, and we are going to uh, extend the event uh, by about uh, ten minutes for those of you who are able to stay, so that we can um, so that we can actually address more of the issues that are coming up. This has um, become a very rich, uh, very rich exchange. Um, so we are going to turn to Ibrahim, but before we do that. Um, um, I see there are a couple of hands uh, raised amongst the participant group here, so I'd like to first give the floor to Francis and then to Natasha to come into the discussion, uh, and then uh, Ibrahim will be going to you with a couple of uh, specific questions that have come in for you. So, um, Francis, we're going to uh, try and bring you on the line here, and as you remember uh, from yesterday's events, um, if you just click the microphone button at the top of your screen, uh, your audio should should be working. So Francis, let me try and give the floor to you and see if you're there. Okay. Okay, yes. Um, thank you. Thank you, Langra, for this opportunity. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you well. Very good. Uh, thank you also for the speakers who have uh, just given very good uh, insight on different aspects of uh, uh, you know, I'm the conflict to this are the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, humanitarian work. But I had a comment. I think um, uh, the discussions uh, were good, but I think uh, especially now that we're focusing this to Eastern Africa and Africa in general, um, uh, there, there are dimensions that we also need to um, uh, to look at. And one of the things, especially when Ashley and uh, Julie were making the presentation very exciting, I was just thinking, okay, when you look at, for instance, some of the structures, within the African Union, for instance, um, uh, for instance, the guidelines for the protection of civilians. Um, very good uh, policy document, but I think over time experience has shown that uh, uh, one of the challenges that is uh, facing the, that platform is uh, uh, certain specific aspects, which I think actually mentioned, and Julie's, for instance, the uh, protection aspect in it, uh, monitoring and reporting aspect, uh, so what we need, for instance, uh, perhaps from the humanitarian agency would be how then do we uh, interpret the, the guidelines, the protection of civilian guidelines, for instance, so that they can speak to the realities and the context. Uh, but more importantly, uh, we develop operational um, uh, guidelines out of the, the overall policy that is already existing. And, and if we do that, then... Uh, some of the challenges that we are facing in countries like Somalia um, uh, with the protracted conflict um, in South Sudan and um, other areas, uh, we would be able to overcome that, uh, especially looking at it, uh, not just from uh, military operation, but uh, a peace support operation um, you know, platform. But also, when I listened to Julie's uh, very good presentation, um, but I also had a couple of uh, comments, but I think for the sake of time, I would limit myself to uh, the area of perception. And um, uh, she mentioned uh, very well a need for coordination, um, uh, you know, uh, but I think um, what, what is required also is so much in terms of um, <clears throat> not just an effective uh, uh, coordination mechanism, but uh, also 
um, you know, the need to make sure that uh, um, the different actors, um, you know, they, they develop a common agenda, especially the humanitarian agencies. If they could harmonize their agenda, then it, it, it would be easier to approach the military forces in terms of negotiating, uh, for instance, creating safe and uh, secure space for them to do their work, and also uh, to negotiate at leadership level, especially at the, EU, uh, at the AU level, on how uh, to, in, to, to, to better influence their structures in terms of uh, how, uh, for instance, children should be protected and other special groups of people uh, should be uh, protected in, in armed conflict. So I think the major challenge that we are still facing as humanitarian is how then do we consolidate our interest and our agenda so that we can, because you can never, we can never, uh, you, you, you can never say that uh, the military and the humanitarian agenda will be the same. What we need is to harmonize, first of all, the humanitarian, then as we face the military in terms of negotiation and dialogue, then we know exactly what we want to do. I wanted us to bring, I wanted to bring attention to group, um, like the, 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 there was an example, for instance, in Somalia, uh, in 1990s when, um, uh, you know, uh, there was some uh, operation and uh, there was a lot of challenges uh, in terms of uh, how the humanitarian agencies uh, approached the whole issue. There was a lot of interest and a lot of perception developed out of that because the, 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 so there were a lot of biasness in terms of uh, how the military uh, you know, dealt to the different uh, agencies uh, without mentioning them. And you find in that case then you bring confusion and again um, a perception is built that uh, uh, such NGOs or such uh, humanitarian agencies have their own agenda other than the local community. So there is a lot of need for interagency approach and also um, you know, uh, coordinating efforts, not just in the field, but also at the planning level and, and collaborating. And, and maybe uh, for, for, for information to colleagues, uh, in uh, the, the African trend, what we're seeing in Africa, especially from the AU down to the regional bodies, there is a lot of effort to have a coordinated effort between the police, the military, and the civilians in terms of intervention. And I think humanitarian agencies, if we could take advantage in terms terms of uh, supporting uh, doctrine development and structure development, then we could have policies that are uh, positive, uh, that are respecting humanitarian uh, uh, principles, but at the same time we are operationally um, efficient uh, to provide uh, service to the vulnerable population, particularly in pockets where we still have protracted conflicts here. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, thank you for that, Francis. Uh, really um, uh, interesting um, uh, comments and uh, from your own experience in the region, very much appreciated. Mm. We'd like to um, now move to Natasha, uh, who I believe is uh, also ready to be connected here in the audio. So just to give a preview here of the order, um, we're going to bring in Natasha uh, on the line. We're then going to be going to Ibrahim uh, with a few uh, questions uh, specifically for him and that's particularly regarding uh, going back to the engagement with armed groups uh, and some of the, the risks uh, and, and realities uh, associated with that. Uh, and then we have uh, a number of of points that we'd like to hear from Jules and building on uh, some of the questions that were already posed to Ashley. So, so we'll go uh, Natasha, Ibrahim, and then Jules. So Natasha, over to you. Hello, and thank you very much to all the speakers. That was really um, interesting. I wanted to just add a couple of quick comments, if I can, from somebody who works Hopefully the volume's a bit better now. Um, yeah, somebody who works slightly more from the political side. Uh, and just, just to start out with, very much as Francis said with the African Union, I think all of the world is becoming more integrated in what they're trying to do. And despite what we can really call as um, pretty unsuccessful efforts in Afghanistan and Iraq, a lot of the methods of work learned there are actually not going to go away. So one of the things that we need to be aware of as a humanitarian community is governments are linking up all of their programs. 
and we are being financed by those same governments. Very strongly the political message is all of the actions need to point in the one direction when either bilaterals or multilaterals intervene. And this is going to more and more affect all of our, our daily working and, and how we're, we're financed to do our jobs. And I think um, the, the time for saying we can stand aside and be separate uh, may, may well be past and it's something that we need to look at. And I'd also point that it's not only the established actors, the big donors that we know, there are newer donors coming in. Uh, a lot of the newer governments look to, to these stove-piped actions and because they're very centrally controlled, they don't understand them. They don't understand the problems we have uh, in bringing interagency, cross-governmental work together. And actually a lot of the time they, they feel we're probably being quite disingenuous in putting that forward. And that's, that's a part of the, the environment we need to deal with. Now where, where that leads to, for me, is, is what several people have pointed to today and that's the level of engagement that we have. If you look in conflict and, and security situations that humanitarians are dealing with today, we are in at the pointy end in a way that we never have been in the past. The work that's being done is, is actually incredible. The tactical level coordination with other actors has really improved, but at the strategic we've got a long way to go. And that, that manifests itself in many ways. A lot of our, our partners in interventions, whether you see them as direct partners or not, uh, have quite long budgetary processes. So we have military that are, are buying large assets a decade in advance. We have um, political situations that are being set up and they're not the immediate reaction that the humanitarians tend to go with. And yet, they are very much incorporating humanitarian actions in all of their lobbying. Now from my experience, as limited as that may be, we don't have strong humanitarian voices in those discussions. We tend to stick very much with, um, as I said, tactical but, but more technical issues. I know that a lot of people engaged in this part of the sector are very aware of this and, and working very hard on it, but it's still not something that we do well. One of the problems we have is, from a personal perspective, um, stove piping civ mill action as a separate part of, of what's going on. I was very pleased to see that the title of this uh, particular event looked at both political and civil and military. At the end of the day, we are all driven by the political. Um, even if that is at a distance and managed by the humanitarians as well as they can, that's where the money's coming from. Um, so the more that we can have policy level discussions that don't separate civ mill action, and remember, most of the people working within the military, in the civil military context, are not the major leaders. The trend is changing, but this is not where the leaders of the army go. They are in operations. These are not the decision makers that we've been talking to, and we need to be really aware of that. Um, I know a lot of people will have uh, other views, but that was just a, a couple of quick points. Many thanks. Many thanks to you, Natasha. Uh, really appreciate it. And I think, um, although I'm sure many people have other views, I think your comments uh, were resonating with a lot of people in the chat. So thank you very much for, um, for putting a voice to those. So we're going to be moving now to Ibrahim. And I'll just, before we call him up, I'll just uh, read the questions that we have coming in from participants uh, specifically following his presentation earlier. So from Mubashir, we have, um, question regarding how, um, uh, from Ibrahim's perspective, and I guess we may be going uh, maybe more into, into the practical discussion, but of course there are, um, there are uh, political policy elements to it. Um, how, uh, if Ibrahim could elaborate uh, how uh, best the humanitarian community can serve, uh, can serve affected communities in Al-Shabaab controlled areas. And then a complementary question um, that came through in the in the chat discussion about whether um, in your view, Ibrahim, there are risks um, when 
international actors do uh, try and reach out, as I believe you were proposing, when they do try and reach out to local aid groups uh, and work more directly with them, does that actually put or can it put um, the local groups at risk? And what would be your, your views on that? Uh, and then another question coming from Panos uh, for Ibrahim asking, again, uh, a practical question of from, from your experience, Ibrahim, or, or in your interactions with organizations uh, operating in Somalia, how responsive uh, has Al-Shabaab been when organizations have tried to engage uh, directly for humanitarian uh, purposes? So what have you uh, observed or uh, others uh, experienced in that regard? So Ibrahim will be calling you in now, and I believe uh, you should be on the line, so I'll give you the floor. Okay, thank you. First of all, let me thank Ashley and Julius for a great presentation. I also wanted to say, and I have another chance, I wanted to say that in spite of my criticism, Somali would have been much worse off without the involvement and the intervention of the international community. When I criticize you for your actions, but we do know that you've helped us a great deal. Now to the question. Uh, in our Shabbat health area, yes, there are organizations, indigenous organizations, who work in our Shabbat health area. They provide a food distribution, they provide teaching, they provide uh, wells, they drill wells. So those organizations are already functioning safely within that tribal environment. If you reach out to them and, 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 and send your, your, your goods and services through them, without seeking uh, visibility, then yes, risk is minimum, and they will be at mostly high to your relationship, but deliver your goods and services. So that's that. The second one, uh, do the international community risk either their lives or the lives of the local organizations when they uh, have a relationship? Yes, there's always risk involved. I will not minimize it. However, uh, the risk only involves the area that the armed conflict is active, where our Shabaab is uh, fearful that they will be losing uh, their grip, and that way they will kill anyone that they think might be uh, working with the other side. However, there are ways to work with the local communities. You provide assistance through acceptable channels, and you will not publicize your involvement. Uh, oftentimes we say that armed groups or, or military uh, involvement in humanitarian assistance does not work. I want to take you back in 1992, December 1992, when U.S. troops landed in Mogadishu. There were plenty of food in Somalia at the time. However, people were starting to get because warlords used to as weapons. They will only deliver those who accept their rule or they only deliver those who identify with them. And there were plenty of food until U.S. troops landed and food was delivered successfully. So if the military force is well organized and able to do the work themselves, it would be great. However, uh, the military engagement that you are talking about at the moment, either whether it's Amazon or Somali national uh, forces, they are not accountable. The government is not powerful enough to account their troops. And the international community, I don't want to say international community, the Amazon troops in Somalia today are not accountable to anybody. They can kill anyone, they can drive over in Mogadishu to anyone, they will not even stop. And we do not see persecution later on, even when this happens. So when that happens, the military is seen as an enemy. Someone who came to protect a tyrant government even though this is the right of the government. So please, we would like to advocate the law, whether it's the military or the civilian government. The poor and vulnerable are already suffering. If you add that a military force that can do anything they want to them without recourse, then they will see the enemy, part of the enemy. What different are you from Al-Shabaab? As you know, the area that Al Shabaab controls, people are fleeing because of their draconian rules. But they really sometimes flee to another troubled place. 
The Somali soldiers are not protecting our public. They are only asking money everywhere they, they, they are. But the international community can partner a local organization successfully. Uh, we need capacity building. Uh, if you build the capacity of this organization that you are partnering with, and you inform them how you want your service to be delivered, and you make sure that you have robust monitoring and evaluation, things will be smoother. Not completely, but better than they are today. Thank you. And thank you, Ibrahim. And uh, thanks to all of you for, for staying. I was just uh, remarking with my colleagues that it's really um, a tremendous discussion that we're having here. And, and again, so many threads uh, going on that we would love to follow up on. Um, but uh, speaking of threads to follow up on and recalling, um, uh, recalling Ashley's responses to uh, several of those questions um, earlier in the event, I've asked uh, Jules to come in and um, pick pick up on, uh, on, on Ashley's response uh, to, the same, uh, to the same set of questions. And also, of course, Jules, if you'd like to uh, respond to any of the other wealth of, uh, of points that have been raised um, uh, by Ibrahim uh, and by others, by, uh, by Natasha and others, uh, you're very welcome to do so. Uh, so Jules, I'm going to give you, the, give you the floor now. OK. Can you hear me? May I be excused? Can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you well. OK, great. I'm on Natasha's headset, so I had to switch. So given the time, I think I'm going to make uh, three primary statements. Number one, coming back to the tension that humanitarian actors have in really creating um, the space that they need or the space that they want in the midst of conflict, um, Ashley highlighted uh, that often agencies are um, walking a very tight rope and that it's not a science. It really is an art. And she said several things that I just would emphasize in short. And there's three primary C's. One is agencies such as World Vision and others have to communicate, communicate, and communicate. You need to be saying why you're there, who you are, and what your purpose and motivation is then you have to be consistent. And uh, that's difficult within an organization um, because individuals act differently. But how do you get a consistent image of your organization and also be true to what you say you're there for? So communicate, be consistent. And thirdly, then, is ensuring your programs are addressing critical needs identified by community and that they're making an impact. Those three C's will contribute to you, an agency having an ability to create an acceptance approach um, from both sides of a conflict. Um, and, I, but again, it's not easy. Analysis and uh, intentionality and deliberate planning and working through these issues is really important. On something that Abraham or Mamuna uh, brought up consensus among humanitarians in these environments and how we relate with armed actors, whether they're state or non-state, is very challenging to achieve. However, despite it being challenging, does not mean we shouldn't strive for this. And we need to put, we need to come to a place where interagency dialogue can take, uh, can occur in an objective manner because agencies have different perspectives. And what we've tried to do through the various guidance is create a platform for discussion at the humanitarian country team or with the NGO forums to move towards that consensus. Because we know that an action by one agency has impact on others, and we need to be aware of that. So let's try to build consensus. And then lastly, um, on the issue of double mandates, or as many people speak about it, a comprehensive approach, integrated missions, smart power, where you have development, defense, and um, diplomacy. There is a real uh, struggle to create the space for independence in that, in that environment. And we need to keep working through that. 
I think it's good that we have right hand and left hand communicating and that we're coming together with the various tools to bring about peace. But humanitarian assistance in the midst of that needs to maintain uh, the boundaries um, and create space from the political and the military agendas despite um, the driving forces that they are. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jules. Um, so we're going to, uh, again, uh, we went a little bit over time, but I'd like to go back once more to Ibrahim and then to Ashley uh, just for very brief um, closing remarks if you have any, uh, any final, final comments or observations on uh, today's discussion. So uh, Ibrahim, I think we still have you on the line, so I'll go to you. Each person making a quiet statement. Uh, Ibrahim, I'm going to try once more to bring you in. Okay, um, so I think we have a problem with the phone line there, uh, so we're going to uh, go next to Ashley. And so, Ashley, you'll have the, the last word here if you have any um, final uh, observations or, or comments on today's discussion. Um, well, I would say that um, it's very early here in New York, and I have to say that this is really worth the, the wake-up call. <laughs> because I think it's been a really interesting discussion with um, very different perspectives um, respectfully articulated on, on the same issues. And I, I have to say that, you know, I found Ibrahim's comments really, really useful in terms of grounding us in the reality of Somalia and the reality of the consultations he's undertaken. Um, what strikes me, particularly with, with Jill's comments, is you know we know what we need to do. We know what the challenges are, and we know what the steps we can take are um, to, to improve both coordination with uh, states and, and uh, armed forces uh, related to states, as well as non-state armed groups. Um, but it's really a matter of coming together and, and finding ways to do that and to support one another to do that, to have stronger humanitarian leadership on these issues um, to prepare ourselves better to deal with these issues, to take time, like the time we've just taken over the, the past hour or so, to reflect on things together um, and, and have something really concrete come out of it. And I really, you know, I think this is great in the lead up to the World Humanitarian Summit, but I'd be curious to, to hear or to encourage participants to think about you know, how they want this to materialize in the process going forward. because that's what it's really about. Um, and it's not as though we're coming to this with a lack of knowledge or understanding. You know, I, I think we really do know what the issues are. Um, and it's a matter of, of taking concrete action and finding ways to, to move forward. Excellent. Thanks so much for that, Ashley. And now um, I think we do have Jules back on. Uh, so if I could, Jules, turn to you if you have any um, uh, brief closing remarks uh, since everyone has stayed with us a bit late, I think we can uh, we can afford the, the time. So I'd like to give the floor to you, Jules, uh, for the last word. I think, uh, thank you, um, impressed with the group here and that they've stayed online. And how is it that we do, as Ashley said, we take the knowledge that we have from the ground level, those that are on the front line day in and day out having these negotiations those that are working on the policy level, how do we get those that are decision makers to really hear what needs to take place from the ground truthing? And then how do we mainstream the tools and the policy to help those that come new into this environment not have to recreate the wheel and that we can actually move forward? Um, critical. Obviously, we're talking about conflict as a world humanitarian theme, unfortunately, because conflict is not going away. Um, and so how we become better at this and working with the various entities who have something to add value, I think, is a challenge for us and that we need to endeavor uh, to do that and to support one another. Thank you, PHAP and World Humanitarian Summit for converging or bringing this group together to have this kind of dialogue.
Great. Thank you, Jules, um, and very much appreciated and so glad you could be a uh, part of the event today. Uh, and so I'm going to wrap things up here. A big thank you uh, again to all of our speakers who are with us today and to all of uh, the participants who stayed uh, in spite of the fact that we continued the discussion now for almost two hours uh, and we could go on. We could go on for a long time. There's a lot here, and as you all know, uh, we, um, as usual, will be putting together uh, a little report, uh, pulling together the threads from the poll questions, the chat, the Q&A, um, so that we can really see that the richness of the discussion and, and keep things moving ahead. Um, so I want to just quickly, before we sign off, point out a few upcoming events that we have in this present series where we're digging into all of the four themes, but specifically looking in the Eastern and Southern Africa region. Um, so we have uh, coming up, the next one will be on the 9th of October, uh, and that will be at, uh, looking at the theme, Reducing Vulnerability and Managing Risk. We'll be looking at humanitarian applications from the development models. Um, then next, on the 16th of October, we'll be moving to transformation through innovation. We're looking at uh, successful scale-up models, specifically in the region. And then finally, at the 23rd of October, humanitarian effectiveness and looking at regional priorities in the realm of effectiveness uh, in Eastern and Southern Africa. I also wanted to point out a special event that we have uh, coming up on the 17th of October, again in partnership with the World Humanitarian Summit, but looking at um, uh, the question of the power of business in the Ebola response. So we'll be looking at the role of the private sector um, in the Ebola response in West Africa. This is a special event coming up in partnership with OCHA and the Summit Secretariat and, uh, of course, hosted by PHAP on the 17th of October. And so with that, I'd like to thank you all once again uh, and encourage you to participate in the online discussions at worldhumanitariansummit.org, discuss on Twitter with hashtag ReshapeAid, and of course, read more about your hosts here at PHAP at www.phap.org. You can also follow the full range of PHAP hosted consultations on Twitter at PHAP Forum. So um, with that, I'd like to sign Sign off uh, here from Geneva, thanking our whole team here and our special guests in the office. It's been a lot of fun and a really uh, important discussion ongoing today, and we look forward to having all of you back with us again in one of our upcoming events. We'll be in touch in the meantime. Goodbye for now. <laughs>